ECT spin statistics and all that from the 1960s, you will see that it's essentially an extended monograph in uh, complex analysis and Hilbert space theory and group representation theory, out of which you prove a lot of rigorous results about uh, quantum fields in flat space time. My problem, however, is that in a generic curved space time, there will be no symmetry whatsoever. And uh, there will also not be a distinguished vacuum state. And moreover, I cannot use global techniques of authenticity because I'll be on a smooth manifold in general. And uh, so I don't have any authenticity theory. And also, I don't even have a global notion of Fourier transform. So all of that's out of the window, which kind of makes things a bit difficult. And we need a principle to replace all of these nice things that we had before. And that principle, in the end, turns out to be local covariance. People have known that for a long time. It's been a matter of, uh, it, it's taken a long time to work out how to do it, and then it took a little bit longer to work out how to set it, which is the, where the category is coming from. So what is this local covariance thing anyway? Well, it starts with some fairly operational considerations. When we do an experiment, we do it in a region of finite extent, say, a large part of Geneva will do. Uh, we also will want to isolate our experimental region from outside influences. Okay? We want to screen it off as far as possible. So we'll need to have some regions that uh, can be isolated to a certain extent. And if I have done that carefully, and I've got my region, it's screened off and so on, and if you've got a region which actually geometrically is the same, then, reason, then we are going to assume, because we'll be stuck otherwise, that the same physics should result. The result of me giving this talk in this room here should be the same as if I give it in an identical hall with identical people, similarly comfortable chairs, uh, in another uh, <laughs> university somewhere else. Okay? There shouldn't be any way of telling from within here, if you don't have too long, that we're in Oxford. screened off all the windows and the rest of it. So here's the sort of picture you'll see a lot. There's a little... Uh, sorry? You would have said it was somewhere else. <laughs> yes. Um, so there is a, a little uh, diamond region. I could embed it in this space-time, I could embed it in that space-time. I shouldn't have to worry too much about what's happening here or here uh, if my experiment is purely done in this region. It's, this, uh, it's like this quotation from Einstein that uh, Andreas mentioned in the context of the uh, EPR. That, uh, I forget the exact phrasing, but uh, well, it doesn't matter. But really, he said we should hold fast to the idea that what happens here should be completely independent of what happens there. If they are, I think the word is spatially separated, yes. I will be using the context of causal separation, which probably was what. Einstein yeah, would have written this. Okay. So I'm going to tell you about how this all works out in a specific class of uh, space times, which are called globally hyperbolic. They are Lorentzian, so uh, they have the same sort of signature as Minkowski space. Uh, but I need to talk about some causal structure. And uh, if we have a time orientation, so we know which way is future and which way is past, I can, for any point, or more generally any set, take the set of all points that can be reached from it by a future directed causal curve, and that's going to be called J+. Plus. Likewise, I can go to the past, following a uh, past directed causal curve. That's J-. Minus. And a sort of primitive experiment could be modelled by a sort of diamond region like this. I prepare it at P, I measure at Q, and uh, this region here, this DMPQ, is all the things that could have been affected by that preparation event and have time to send a message back to the measurement event. Right? So if I screen that, of course, I'll be stuff coming in from outside, right? but I would try to screen that off as best as possible. Right? So this is a sort of region of space-time that can be isolated, can be screened off. And uh, I also I want to be able to do that from operational um, perspective. I want to be able to put a screen around this experiment, so I'm going to want that to be compact. All such regions I will demand are compact, and um, I will also, as I say, throw away the possibility of time travel, no full closed causal curves. If those two conditions uh, 
are satisfied, we have what is called a uh, globally hyperbolic space time. It's a good place to do physics and also to do category theory because we can turn these guys into a category. So this is how it's done. Um, if I uh, take a subset of the globally hyperbolic space time, which contains all the diamond regions where the preparation and the measurement occur inside it. So, in other words, no part of any primitive experiment that starts and finishes in this region needs to know about anything else. I will call that a globally hyperbolic subset. And a hyperbolic embedding of one a globally hyperbolic manifold in another is going to be an isometry. So we do have this, uh, you know, the geometry is identical. I'm also going to preserve orientation. So not only handedness in the uh, three-dimensional sense, but also future and past. Okay? So if I have an embedding like that, such that the image, psi of m, is uh, a globally hyperbolic subset, then I will call this a hyperbolic embedding and it's not so hard to find that these satisfy the conditions to give you a category. And that's the category man, which sounds very anthropocentric, but it's <laughs> short for uh, man for as well as anything else. Okay, what is quantum field theory? Well, I'm going to take an approach which is sometimes called the algebraic approach, and uh, it's a bit different from what you'll find in many books, because there aren't necessarily any Hilbert spaces floating about, and there aren't necessarily any fields floating about. Okay, so this is, well, it's slightly different, but it's, uh, it is equivalent, in fact, more general than the usual framework. So if I'm going to do this theory in curved space-time, to every one of these space-times, I need to assign some mathematical objects and encode the theory. That's going to be a star algebra of observables. It might be a C-star algebra, um, could be just a topological algebra, it might even have no topology at all, just a star algebra. I'm not assuming that it's a concrete algebra represented on a particular Hilbert space, this is an abstract algebra at this stage. I also will need to talk about states, um, but if I talk about all the states of this algebra, that will probably get too many, so I'll probably need to restrict myself to a certain class of states that have to be selected. If I'm feeling generous, I will allow myself the luxury of some fees. Okay, but this is not an essential part of the theory. How do we interpret it? Um, if uh, A is one of the elements of the algebra and omega is one of our states, I apply omega, which is a linear functional, to A. That gives me a number, a complex number. That's the expectation value of this observable quantity in that state. Um, traditionally, uh, one would say that it's the self-joint uh, elements, the ones which are equal to their own stars, that are the observables. Um, but that's on the basis that you want to get a real number out of this thing as well. Why not get a number? There are, the only conditions that the state has to satisfy are that if you give it the identity operator, you get one, and uh, which is a sort of normalization of the probabilities, and also that if I give it anything that is a positive element of the algebra, namely A star A, uh, I should get uh, a positive answer. If I want them, I can get Hilbert space representations using the so-called GNS theorem, Gelfand, Neimark, and Siegel, but in fact I won't do that at all uh, in the rest of the talk. I'm also uh, not assuming at any point that I have an underlying classical action. Okay, I'm just saying I want to have a star algebra and some states. And will your star algebra necessarily be a C star algebra? Or not necessarily. Not? Okay. In fact... So could you always use the GNS theorem? Yes, GNS will work okay. in a star algebra. You don't need anything more than that. So let's have an example. And uh, this one, of course, does come from the classical action, the Klein-Gordon theory, free Klein-Gordon theory. It's a partial differential equation where this is the covariant... Uh, Cassian, and um, it's well posed in globally hyperbolic space times. So it's a nice uh, PDE to look at. What well posed means is that we have green functions. We have a retarded green function and an advanced green function. And uh, they have the properties that if I 
take a, a source and hit it with the green function and then hit that with the uh, wave uh, operator, I get back the source I started with. The retarded and advanced bit means that I know something about where these um, solutions are supported. Um, the retarded green function is supported in the causal future of the source and for the advanced one, of course, it's in the causal past. One of the things I will do with this intensively is um, take the difference between the uh, retarded, uh, sorry, the advanced and the retarded green functions, and that will define for me uh, a bi-solution to the client coordinate equation called E. And I can do this in every globally hyperbolic space time. Still thinking of this as a classical uh, system, if I look at the space of real solutions to that equation, I can think of it as a phase space, and the classical observable will be a function on that phase space, and one of the simplest is simply to take a solution and integrate it against a test function, a smooth, compactly supported function. So that's going to give me a particular class of, uh, real, uh, of um, observables, and they satisfy um, a number of properties. Obviously, the assignment um, of this classical observable to a test function is complex linear, um, since phi is going to be a real solution, I have this uh, equation here that if I take the complex conjugate of the observable, I get the observable corresponding to the complex conjugate of the test function. This equation here is the field equation, essentially, um, because what it's saying is if instead of f I put box plus m squared f in there, it should vanish. And that's true by an integration by parts twice. So that's uh, um, how the field equation turns up in, in these relations. And also, another thing you know about classical mechanics is that there are things called Poisson brackets. And if I calculate the Poisson bracket for two of these observables, it works out in terms of this bi-solution E uh, that I uh, had on the previous slide. Now, Dirac told us how to quantize systems. Um, and it's fine as far as it goes. You can get it to work a, a little bit, but that's enough for us. We're going to introduce a star algebra. It's going to be generated by some um, elements of the algebra, phi, sub m, of f. They're labeled by the test functions, and these are the quantizations of those classical observables from the previous transparency. So the relations can be read straight off from what happens in the classical namely that the assignment has to be complex linear. Um, if I ask what happens, what, what generator do I get from f bar? Well, it's the generator uh, associated with f star. And if I uh, have the field equation, if I uh, plug in a test function, which is box plus m squared on the test function, it vanishes. And then this is the quantization bit. Poisson brackets go over to commutators as a factor of i, and since it's a scalar, I, I get a, an identity in there. And that's it. I'm sorry, this expression, EMFF prime, has integrals in it, right? Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's a distribution. All right. yeah. Now, informally, sorry, I'm going to one. You said stand close to it, you can say it's <laughs> a Z2. Um, so, um, informally, think of. Um, these phi m of x as the result of integrating a uh, quantum field against a test function. That's what you can think, but notice that I haven't inserted any phi m x's as uh, fundamental parts of the theory. This is an interpretation, if you like. What you really have is an algebra with some generators and some relations. Now, so I've managed to uh, set this up. Uh, in every space time, I have an algebra. I need some states. And uh, there is a class of states that we look at which are called Hadamard states. And um, I'm not going to say too much about it, um, except to say that the core of the thing is if I take the product of two of these generators and evaluate the state on it, I want to get a nicely behaved object out. Okay? Um, as we just described, this thing is also going to be uh, a distribution. Okay, or at least that's going to be a, 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 a restriction. I 
plug in two functions, I get a number out, uh, and I'm going to want this to be continuous with respect to the test function topology. But most significantly, I'm going to make a requirement on the so-called wavefront set of this distribution. I'm not going to say what that is at all, except that it um, basically classifies the singularities of this distribution, and it is a subset of the cotangent bundle of the manifold on which the distribution is defined. In, that, in this case, that's uh, the Cartesian product of the space-time of itself, uh, and so I actually live in uh, two copies of the cotangent bundle of the space-time, and the property it has is quite nice. Uh, it has to live in the product of um, future directed null covectors, and the first factor, past directed null covectors in the second part. Okay, so that's the condition. I haven't told you what a wavefront set is, um, but you can see that there is uh, a mathematical object that encapsulates this condition. What it does for us, the Hadamard condition, is that when we take the difference of the two-point functions, these W omegas, um, when we have two Hadamard states, we get a smooth function. So, the nice thing about them is that their differences are smooth, and that allows me to do something which we like to do in quantum field theory, to form wick squares. Um, I think Lewis said it yesterday, when you try to take products of quantum fields that are highly singular, this is what you do about it, you make a subtraction to take out the singular bit. Because my condition uh, was precisely to say, I know what the singular part of this uh, two-point function is, uh, when I do that, I've arranged that the singularities cancel out, I have a smooth function here, I can go onto the diagonal. So this is a, a regularization. It's the sort of calculation that people have done a uh, huge amounts in the literature on quantum field theory. It's the starting point for a full-blown uh, development of perturbation theory in curved space-time. So just a little bit more about later. Now, there's quite a lot missing from what I've just told you. And one of the problems is that these algebras, by themselves, don't tell you very much at all. And uh, one of the peculiarities is, for example, I can construct a faithful star homomorphism from the tensor product of this algebra, this klein Gordon algebra, uh, with itself back into itself. Okay? Now, this is the algebra of two fields. So I can somehow embed the theory of two fields inside the theory of one field. Okay? Now, how does that work? Okay? Well, it's a cheat, of course. It's one of these mathematical tricks. All your Hilbert space is a finite dimensional one, I notice. Uh, of course, one of the nice things about uh, infinite dimensional separable Hilbert spaces is that they are all isomorphic. So, in particular, if I want to take uh, H, tensor H, it can be isomorphic to H. Okay, this is a pretty typical thing that will happen in infinite dimension spaces. These algebras are actually based on symplectic spaces, not Hilbert spaces to start with, but the same is true. Uh, and all I do is cook up one of these silly um, injections, in fact, uh, from the uh, direct sum of this uh, symplectic space with itself back into itself. All right? I take the whole thing, the whole thing which is the data for the evolution, I map that onto even data, okay? And then I've still got all the old functions left, you see, and they are from perspective. So there are silly ways of, of doing this. But if, yes? That, you won't go to that naturally, that's silly. This is where we'll come to. This is why knowing what the algebras uh, are is not enough, okay? So there has to be more. Um, now, the other thing is that when I defined this Wick polynomial, I used a reference state. I subtracted off uh, a two-point function for some omega prime. Okay. But how do I select omega prime? It would be all right if there was a distinguished one, but I started off by saying there is no distinguished state. Right. So I need to find some way of, uh, well, if you want to be uh, 
over globin bacteria, you can say trivializing the co-cycle, uh, find a way of defining this uh, wick power without using any reference states. And so the thing that I told you before is actually just the difference of expectation values of two of those things. And so well, there's, there's no vacuum state? There is no distinguished vacuum state in the general curve space time. Um, now I want to do that in, in inverted commas, the same way in all space times. So I need to have a notion of the same way in all space times, and it begs the question in the first place, well, in what sense was the theory I described to you before the same anyway? So we need to have an account of these things, and we need to pick up on that question about naturality. Now you say that, by the way, from a maths perspective, right? But if you tell the physicists to this, uh, when they've finished beating you about the head with part of the data book, um, then they will probably say also, but that's not natural, right? And they mean that in a more physical sort of way, and the point is that they are indeed the same sort of uh, attitude. Okay, so this brings us to uh, the approach that uh, uh, Brunetti, Frayden, Harding and Fair uh, set down in 2003. There's a long prehistory to this, and in some ways what they were doing was uh, crystallizing things that were known, or partly known, before. But they gave it a very nice expression, which I'll describe. So, we augment what I said before, which was that we should have an algebra to every space-time, by saying that this should indeed be functorial. Okay? I should have a functor from uh, my category of manifolds to a category of star algebras, uh, unital star algebras and uh, the morphisms are going to be unit preserving faithful star morphisms. So, so what, what morphisms do you mean in the category manifolds? All smooth maps? The, no, these hyperbolic embeddings. So these are the uh, isometric orientation preserving ones where the uh, image is a globally hyperbolic subset. Okay. And embedding, you mean like monomorphisms? The embedding of man they are mon monomorphisms. Um, I also want to have an assignment of uh, states. Or, remember, these were subsets of the uh, state space, the full state space of the uh, algebra. So I'm going to have a functor running in the opposite direction. I didn't mention this one actually is a covariant functor. Unsurprisingly, this one is contravariant. And uh, states here, in the target category, is going to consist of uh, convex subspaces of state spaces of star algebras, and its morphisms will be affine maps between these convex subspaces. Uh, and again, um, if one wants, you can say that this um, the constraint is that S, uh, our assignment of state spaces, should be a subfunctor of the uh, functor that assigns the full state space to all of these uh, algebras. So, in particular, um, the key thing is that uh, its, action, its action on morphisms is to give us the dual map to the way that the functor acts on morphisms. It's usually restricted. So here's a picture to illustrate what's going on. Here's one of my favorite little diamond regions. It's got mapped into uh, a larger space-time N. Um, I have algebras associated with each of these space-times. And uh, in particular, I take an observable in M, and I can map it forwards using the uh, functor and get an observable in N. I can also take a state in N and pull it back using the uh, state space functor to get a state on M. And of course, the way these line up is that it doesn't matter at all which way where I do this. Uh, I can evaluate the expectation value on the pushed forward observable um, or using the pulled back state, and I should get the same answer. And what that means, physically, is that any experiment I conduct in here should be uh, capable of being replicated over in M with identical results. Okay. Now, there's a slightly subtle point here. Um, which was missed in the original BFV exposition, because what you'd also want is that any experiment in here can be replicated over here with identical results. But this uh, 
mapping S of psi is not invertible in general, which raises an interesting question. Fortunately, what we can insist, or we, what we can ask for, uh, is that um, when we look at the closure, so yes, so what, what's the problem? So there might be some states on here that do not come from well-behaved states over there. Right? And that suggests, well, maybe I could set things up in a funny way, do an experiment and get a number that I could never get by doing experiments over here. Okay. What rescues us is another operational observation. Fortunately, we only ever do finitely many experiments, and we only do them to finite accuracy. Okay? So if we're just a bit realistic about what we can do, that actually limits the information we can extract uh, about a state. Uh, it's a topological thing. Okay? It says we can get quite, we can uh, uh, really only narrow down a state to within some sort of neighbourhood in what is uh, technically the weak star topology uh, in the state space. And so we can resolve this problem uh, of uh, making sure that these two are completely indistinguishable from the physical perspective by uh, adding this additional requirement that I call local physical equivalence, that the state space here um, should have the same weak star closure as what I get by pulling back states from over there. Okay. Now that's, okay. yes. The airplane states can take pure states to mix the states, right? Yes, it can. Right. Yeah. And so maybe there's some way of understanding this in terms of the capital color and all that. Uh, I've been uh, explained uh, the weak star closure. No, it's more than that, actually. Uh, the sort of example that um, uh, shows that the map can't be invertible is the uh, so-called Rindler vacuum. You take the right wedge in Minkowski space. That is, a, you've got a nice state just on this uh, little piece of Minkowski space out there. But when you work out what its energy density is, it diverges as you head to this. This, by the way, is the curve T equals X. This is T equals minus x, um, the energy density diverges as you approach this horizon. Now, a Hadamard state, just like those Wick uh, um, polynomials all have to be smooth, they have to have smooth energy density. So any Hadamard state on here has to be, on the whole space time, has to be smooth across this. Right. So you can tell immediately that there are states that are well behaved on the wedge that cannot possibly just get pulled back from nice states on the, on the whole space time. Okay, so there's a, a non-trivial additional uh, condition you need to check. And for people who know about C star algebras, if your theory is based on C star algebras, uh, there is a, a result of Fell, uh, which basically says that uh, actually, a lot of the, uh, although you do have inequivalent states, they're not actually so different when you consider weak star topologies. And that actually proves, or can be made to prove, local physical equivalence, which is a bit of an irony, as Fell's theorem was held up for a long time as a sort of problem with algebraic quantum field theory. In this context, it kind of rescues the day. If you're just using star algebras, however, there is something additional to prove. And that's been proved for the fine gordon algebra, but not yet for Wick polynomials. It seems to be maybe quite difficult. Let's see how um, this whole functorial thing works for Klein Gordon. So here's uh, my space time. I take a test function in here. I can, of course, push it forward to get a test function in n just by composing with the inverse where that makes sense and setting it to zero otherwise. It looks a bit funny, doesn't it? Pushing forward rather than pulling back. But, um, uh, this is, in fact, the right thing to do. Um, if you want, you can think of it as pull back. No, wait a minute. Distributions push forward in a nice way. And in a way, this is what it really is. Um, now, so I can associate test functions in here, test functions in there. And now I simply generate my um, homomorphism between the algebras by saying that the generators go over in the same way. Phi m of f has to get mapped to phi n of psi star f. Okay? And the only thing that I need to check is that this is compatible with all the relations that I set down. 
Um, and the reason that is true is um, partly because the push forward intertwines the, um, the Plasin on the Clevarian Plasin on the two space times. That's because of the isometry, and also because read functions are unique. Okay, those two things are important. But after that, it's uh, basically an exercise. I also need to check, of course, that my state spaces are functorial as well. I'm going to, given the time, I'm going to skip over this. Um, all I'm going to tell you is that the um, pulled back, the two-point function of the pulled back state is the pullback of the two-point function of the state star. Okay? That combined with the fact that wave front sets behave in a um, contravariant way under um, pullbacks is all you need to know. Okay? So the uh, wave front set of my pulled back state has to end up being in the pullback of future pointing nulls, past pointing nulls. Well, if I have something null over here and pull it back, it's still null because everything was an isometry. So I end up with a wave front set living in the product of future pointing and past pointing uh, null covectors, which is my Hadamard condition. So this is factorial uh, in the required way. So briefly, what a field is uh, as far as BFV go. Um, of course, this assignment of test functions, the spaces of test functions, is itself a functor. Um, to various categories, but maybe we could just take vector spaces uh, as one. And then we're going to say that a scalar field, a linear scalar field, is any natural transformation between that assignment of test function spaces to the algebra when we forget it's an algebra and drop back to the category of vector spaces. Okay? And what that means in practice is that when I hit one of my generators with a morphism A of psi, then it should be what I get by first pushing forward my test function and then uh, smearing in N. And that is, of course, how we defined A of psi, so everything is true by definition uh, for this model. Now, of course, we can do a lot more here. We can generalize the sort of test functions we use. We could maybe even have distributional smearings. And one of the nice things about category theory from this viewpoint is you just change a few letters here or there and you change the, change the way things are. So if I, um, this forgetful functor, if I uh, forget a bit more and drop onto uh, just sets, then I'm not doing linear fields, I'm doing nonlinear fields. Or if I, if I want, I could work in topological spaces and I have some topology but, but no more. Um, so those are, are useful things to do from time to time. <laughs> One of the really uh, surprising things about this BFV framework is the way it relates to the stress tensor. Now, I need to remind you that I've not assumed for the general setting that there was any background classical action. I'm not assuming that I'm working with a free quantum field. The example I gave was, but I'm not making this assumption. I make one more assumption which is that if I have an embedding of space-times such that the image contains what is called a Cauchy surface for the uh, larger space-time, then this morphism A of psi must in fact be an isomorphism. And I need to tell you what a Cauchy surface is. Well, any globally hyperbolic space-time uh, can in fact be foliated by Cauchy surfaces. These are space-like surfaces intersected exactly what by every inextendable uh, timeline curve will do as a definition. Okay. And they're, put another way, they're good surfaces for specifying initial data for the inclined wall uh, equation. So if I have uh, such a, an embedding, I assume I have an isomorphism of the algebraism. And now I can take a little tour. If M is a space-time of interest, I can, over here, set up another space-time, which is basically the same, except in one little region where I perturb the metric just a bit. Okay? So the metric over here is G of M, whatever that was, plus H. I also identify um, a 
Hakoshi surface up here and the little region around it that is a globally hyperbolic subset, I do the same down here. I can consider those regions as space times in their own right, okay, in which case I have an inclusion, top and bottom, which is a, a morphism in our category man. And if this uh, perturbation isn't too severe here, what I'm left with is another globally hyperbolic space time, and the obvious inclusions top and bottom will also um, be isometries. I think I should probably, to be absolutely precise, put an H as a subscript on each of those maps. It doesn't matter very much. The main point is that every single one of these embeddings induces an isomorphism of boundaries. So I can now go on a tour, um, and because they're isomorphisms, I can go against the flow of the arrows when I want. Okay, so I can start off in M, go backwards along this one to the algebra for N minus, forwards along this one to the algebra for the perturbed space time, backwards along that one to N plus, forwards along that one, back to the space time that I started. Okay? So I can compose all of those and I get an automorphism of the space to the algebra of the space time that I started in. Okay? This, of course, is induced by no more than H. You can actually show it's independent of how you chose these uh, Cauchy surfaces. Um, and so it's sort of intrinsic. It, it says a little bit how this theory reacts to small changes in the metric. Okay? And what we can do is try to differentiate that. And assuming uh, some sort of weak differentiability of, of these uh, Maps, I can assume, I could say, for example, uh, consider what happens if I take a family of perturbations, lambda times some tensor F, and fix some observable, differentiate what happens. And that's a derivation on the algebra, and I'm going to write it as if there were an algebra element Tm of F, but we don't have to have an algebra element. Um, think of this as a, as a way of writing a derivation. Uh, and it is, uh, we claim, a stress tensor. How do we know it's a stress tensor? Well, it's conserved. You can prove that in, in general. In models, like the klein uh theory, you know what you mean by the stress tensor. You can calculate the commutators and they work out to agree with this uh, thing. And also, uh, of course, um, it actually fits very naturally with the idea you pursue in ordinary field theory. You take the action, you differentiate with respect to the metric, and what comes out is the stress tensor. Well, we didn't have an action, but we did find something that was sensitive to perturbation of the metric. So this uh, relative Cauchy evolution is somehow standing in place of the classical action uh, for this purpose. So, stress tensor encodes how the theory responds to metric perturbations. Okay. Now, my impression is that most people here are not quantum field theory specialists. So, I'm not going to tell you too much about what all these successes I'm listing here are, except that there's a common theme, which is that there was all this famous stuff from the 60s, and, and well, subsequent work, of course, proving very nice results about quantum fields fast space time using analyticity, Fourier transform, and all the rest of that. And over the past, really, 10 years, a lot of this is being imported into the curved space time context uh, by various people, you can see this here, um, using this locally covariant approach as, as the key tool. Now, it doesn't have to be formulated in categories. Um, you, can, you can written all of these things down perfectly well. Whether anybody would have thought of relative Cauchy evolution, I'm not so sure, but in principle, somebody might have stumbled if they've done the right thing. Now, turning to uh, an example, um, this is altogether more concrete, uh, and it relates to a previous interest of mine, but still current interest of mine, for uh, quantum energy and and this is, uh, starts from the strange fact that quantum fields can have negative energy densities. And that's something rather different from classical fields. But they can't be too negative for too long. 
And uh, a sort of representative result of that, for, uh, of this, would be that if we take a, a little, um, say, a diamond subspace time of Minkowski and a timeline geodesic in that diamond, and I take the energy density along that geodesic uh, in a Hadamard state, somewhere along that geodesic, it has to ex the energy density has to exceed minus c over tau to the fourth. So obviously for a very short-lived geodesic, that's a very weak constraint, which is just as well because you can push the energy density way down over short periods of time. If you have a long time, then somewhere the energy will have to come up quite close to zero. So there are lots of results like this. Oh, the number c is sort of pi and a bit, um, which has no particular significance. Um, one of the problems, we, we spent a long time proving nice results, nice rigorous results, um, using all of this wavefront set technology in um, flat and curved space times. But of course, when you try to actually calculate what band you've got, you find you've got a nasty calculation on your hands. So it's not so easy to get numbers out. But you can use covariance as a cheap trick in some cases. Here's the, the case I have in mind. Let's suppose that we have a space-time which happens to have a little Minkowski region embedded in it, exactly Minkowski. Of course, a physicist might now start to say, well, what about approximately Minkowski? Let's uh, stick with exactly Minkowski for the moment. Um, well, what I know is a bound on uh, energy densities along this line in this diamond here. But I use the covariance trick. And I say, OK, well, I can push forward the curve as well. There it is, gamma tilde. And if I take the supremum of the energy density in this space-time along that curve in any Hadamard state on this space-time, I can, of course, pull that back to the question over here about um, averages of the energy density in Hadamard state, in the Hadamard state uh, on D. And I've got a bound for those. So I immediately can, can conclude that I get my bound. It's greater than or equal to minus pi and a bit over tau to the fourth. And that's to do with this um, contravariance of the state space point. Now, one doesn't need to have the categories again for that. Um, it's a clean way of saying what you mean by this bound is covariant. Okay? It gives you a nice framework for doing it. Um, but it isn't completely essential. Let me give you an application. Um, let's suppose we have a space-time which on one half is sort of a fairly general static space-time and on the other half is uh, basically Minkowski all the way. And, I, and you tell me you've got the ground state and you want to know what the energy density is and how, how negative can it be. Well, what I do is put a little diamond region in here and say, well, I know that somewhere on here it has to be greater than or equal to minus constant over tau to the fourth. Where tau to the fourth is the duration of this little curve here. How long can that be? Well, I need to keep my diamond in the Minkowski region. Okay? So it comes out in terms of that distance there. That's the sort of the radar distance out of the, from where you are to the edge of the uh, Minkowski region. And so what we can find is a band that says that the energy density anywhere in here is actually constant from that, has to be uh, greater than or equal to minus a constant times the fourth power of your distance from the Minkowski region. Now, if you tried to prove that there handedly, oh, you would maybe conclude fairly quickly on dimensional grounds that it's going like one over the fourth power of the distance. You wouldn't know what this constant was at all. And without any work, really, you find an estimate what the constant is. And this comes from local covariance. Not necessarily in a category framework, but it is the covariance structure that's doing it. Now, as a sort of exercise, I set myself a um, question, can you write all of this quantum inequality stuff down in the category language? And that was initially a formal question, so I could teach myself this framework a bit more. The bigger background question is, well, does this canonical stress tensor that just drops out of the theory satisfy the quantum inequality? That's what I'd really like to know in the end. Well, I learnt a few things, but I didn't actually manage to solve the question. 
Um, but along the way, uh, this actually led to identifying this missing ingredient I told you before, this local physical equivalence. It turns out you would need that if you were going to have any, proof, any hope of proving that. So we learned a few things, and also that these, um, the curiosity really, these abstract fields, which are thought of as natural transformations, they can be made into an algebra. Okay? But at the level of the natural transformation, so I can add two of them together, I can compose them in certain ways. Right? Now, these are no longer elements of the algebra, these are the natural transformations between two functors. Okay? So, um, it's not very developed, but what it is, is a way of doing, or talking about, quantum field theory in curved space times without the space times. Okay? You work, you, potentially, you could work at the level of these functors and natural transformations, forget about the space times, uh, unless you actually need to do a, a, a concrete calculation or something dreadful like that. What do you make of horizontal and vertical composition of natural transformations? Ah, so we, haven't got, <laughs> we haven't got that far. Okay. But, I mean, that, that, that is the sort of thing which is clearly going to come up very yeah. soon. Now, um, for the last part of the talk, uh, what I want to do is look at the question of whether this condition that BFV set down is actually enough to do what you really want, which is to guarantee that you have the same physics in all space times. It seems very reasonable on the surface. Actually, it turns out that it well, is necessary, but certainly by no means sufficient for this to represent a quantum field theory. And you can, of course, do it by playing a typical mathematical game. We said we were interested in um, theories that were functors from the manifolds to the algebras. Okay? Well, they, of course, if I put them together, form a category, right? The functor category. So what I can now do is ask about functors from the space-times to the functors from the space-times to the algebras. Right? There are such things. Right? As I say, it's a, math yeah. math math it's a joke. Really. Yeah, sure. I think it's quite a good one, but anyway. <laughs> so, um, this is what I'm going to do. What does that mean? It means that to each space-time, I assign a whole theory across all space-times. Right? And it's going to be covariant right, in this sense. What I actually want, of course, is to turn that into a theory in the BFV sense. And unsurprisingly, it's a diagonal. Okay. I take, if in space-time M, I take the theory for space that was indicated by space-time M, and I ask what it does in space-time M. Okay. I could have asked about it in any other space-time, but I choose to ask about it in space-time itself. I need to say what happens to the morphisms, uh, and there is a way of doing that. Of course, the theory in space-time M has a view on what happens to a morphism. But also, because this C thing is a functor between uh, these, what it actually does, what C does to a morphism, is give me a natural transformation between the theory indicated for space-time M and the one that made by space-time N. So I can take the components of that natural transformation uh, appropriate to space-time N and uh, compose it with this thing here. And if you do that, you actually find that what you've constructed is a functor. It's very simple to uh, prove that. So this theory satisfies the BFV criteria. It is a covariant quantum field theory, apparently. But if we manage to do things right, uh, this, these CMs will be different theories in different space times. Okay. So covariance is not quite the end of the subject. And of course this one, because I made sure it's a functor. This genuinely is. Uh, there, there are natural things going on here in this example. So it looks as though we can satisfy covariance while having different physics in different space times. Here's a way of doing it. Um, I select, depending on the topology of the Cauchy surface, one scalar field if um, I have non-compact surf Cauchy surfaces and two scalar fields otherwise. Okay, that's what I do. Um, I guess time is moving on, so I'm not going to say too much about this, um, other than 
Uh, the key to making it all work is that if I have a space-time with compact Cauchy surface embedded uh, in any other manifold, then their Cauchy surfaces must be homeomorphic. Okay, so this sort of preserves the uh, topology of the Cauchy surface. But I can, of course, put non-compact uh, space times with non-compact Cauchy surface in space times that have compact Cauchy surface. But I can go up, but I don't have to worry about maybe going down. So what that means is I can patch things up. So I genuinely manage to get myself a functor that in uh, space times with non-compact Cauchy surface really is the theory of one scalar field and in space times with compact Cauchy surface really is two scalar fields. Okay? And you can generalize this because as I say, these uh, for embeddings of manifolds with compact Cauchy surfaces, the uh, Cauchy surfaces have to be homeomorphic. So choose your favorite topological invariant and you can have as many scalar fields kicking around in certain space times as you want. So this is a bit of a problem. Mind you, of course, it comes back to this question, is one field really different from two fields? So that's something we have to sort out. Um, but it does, it does uh, you would imagine that they are different. And so there is a, a real problem here. Just uh, quickly, you can, of course, work out what the relative Cauchy evolution is for this uh, silly theory that we've cooked up. And it turns out that it is the, um, it's the relative Cauchy evolution in the space-time uh, that you were dealing with, composed with another um, one of these cycles, which actually comes from the natural transformations in this C functor. I'm going to set all of those equal to the identity, which is what actually happened in our example. If I do that, I've got the same relative Cauchy evolution. So even at the level of stress tensors, these theories really are um, two fields in this space time, one field uh, in, in the other. So something's missing. We need a criterion here. And this is uh, what uh, Ryan Affair and I are uh, working on. And here is a proposal. What we should do is, in any space time, identify some local algebras okay, within that space time, internally. And the way we do it is by selecting the uh, observables in uh, the algebra of that space time that commute with this stress tensor whenever it is smeared with something in the causal complement of your little region S. Okay? So the interpretation here is that we are collecting together the observables that are insensitive to metric perturbations in the causal complement, okay? which you might think is a, is a good way of zeroing in on this region here. Now then we can actually put in a requirement that these algebras should be basically the same, I'll explain what basically the same means in a moment, as what would happen if you treated that little region as a space-time in its own right and asked what your functor did to it. Okay. Because that's also inside your algebra of space-time n. It's basically equal to is some kind of a closure. Right? And there are various ideas, I'm not sure what the best criterion will be. Um, we've checked that this holds for uh, massive scalar fields. There is a slight problem where you have some gauge freedoms kicking around, uh, because then you can actually find that there are observables that commute with all stress tensors and and that's a little bit of a nasty point. Um, but anyway, we have ideas about what can be done. Um, and uh, that some kind of refinement of this structure is, is what is needed. Let's just see how it um, gets rid of our one field, two field model. Well, suppose I have a space time n with a compact Cauchy surface, and I've got two fields, and my local algebras, because the stress tensors coincide, remember, we check that, will be the local algebras that really do correspond to two scalar fields. Okay? On the other hand, I take something that's non compact. I will genuinely have um, the algebra for one scalar field, and the way it embeds in the big algebra is you just embed one copy and you tensor in the identity on the other half. Okay? These things are clearly not the same, 
and you can see that you violate the new criteria. So it neatly um, violates this uh, condition. And of course, what we also want to do is show that it would violate all possible, you know, if you impose these conditions, there's no way you can hook up a theory that will get around uh, all of these uh, conditions. Okay. So, um, do I have time for this last? Uh, How are we doing? Just finish an hour. Have I? Oh dear, I'm terribly yeah. sorry. Well, so I, I would like to just um, well say so one thing. Um, something that you can do um, is to look at the natural isomorphisms of one of these functors to itself. Um, and if you do that, you'll find <coughs> that instead of being what I expected, which was a very, very large set, get a very, very small thing. In fact, you get Z2 if you have one massive field. So this naturality is an extremely strong constraint. And in fact, this G of A turns out to be the, uh, probably is the gauge group of the theory, the global gauge group of the theory. So that's what I'm saying now. And conclude. Uh, what we do here is clarify the uh, status of local covariance in, in this categorical term. A lot of recent developments are based on it. You don't absolutely have to use the categories, but it gives you a good way of thinking. And certainly following the arrows gives you a few new things, like a stress tensor, local physical equivalence, this global gauge group, and so on. And I think what I would say is that the stress tensor is, is key to all of this in the end. And then there's this question whether, in fact, you can do quantum field theory in curved space-time without the space-time. Field theories um, are expected to be examples of this. And of course, the real question is how you construct an interacting field theory, even in Minkowski space. Um, perturbatively, you can construct interacting fields in uh, four dimensional curved space times, and that has been done by Brunetti, Creighton, Hagen, Holland's wall. And the Holland's wall bit of it really was to use covariance to complete the whole um, framework and show that you can genuinely um, reduce the thing to your normalization constants rather than uh, maybe the normalization functions that wouldn't really, wouldn't really be too much use to. So they fit in uh, interpretively um, and this is all axiomatic quantum field theory. So what we're doing here is saying this is what an interacting quantum field theory ought to do. And the hope would be that you can, by studying that, learn about how uh, properties of interacting fields can be imported from the Minkowski space. Uh, the whole constructive thing, of course, is a, is a big goal. Um, but it's quite, you know, quite likely out of reach yeah. uh, for the foreseeable future. I think it's a theorem that anything that can't be constructed in flat space can't be constructed in curved space. <laughs> Say what, what um, you're trying to find is through this one field, two fields yes. situation is in some sense the global criterion you're looking for. Um, so this is the one instance where you actually need something which is global. Or well, we try aspect. to reduce it to, I mean, the idea has been to remove that global aspect by saying there should be local algebras. Yeah. These are things that are insensitive to what else is happening out there. Now, you might say that. I've had to talk about what's happening out there in order to frame, frame that uh, condition. But it is, it is an attempt to say that uh, there should be an intrinsic notion of what the local observables are that you can compare with the extrinsic notion that comes from regarding this as a space-time in its own life. I see. sort of two-dimensional version of this, but we're the one that gets the kind of stress energy tense or conformal field theories. There are, um, yes, there are some comments in a paper of Bert Schroer where um, he 
who talks about this quite briefly, um, and I think from memory he is saying that you would indeed get that. Um, of course, you, you wouldn't just be isometries, you would then be looking at conformal embeddings. Um, so he at least has enunciated that, um, and uh, so I can refer you to his paper. He hasn't worked it out. He hasn't worked it out in detail. It is, it is a comment in passing. Uh, and what, what was the motivation? Just look for embeddings and not for general maps. Okay, for you mean um, I mean absolute general maps. Well, the the, the original just... motivation is that if the regions are geometrically identical, they should, <coughs> they should support the same physics. Okay, that's the way we've understood uh, covariance. So that's what we've been encoding so far, this is isometry, okay, which already forces quite a lot of the properties. Um, you can, and in fact, um, I began with a, with a rather quixotic question of, well, we know, if we know what it is to do the same theory in all space-times in the same dimension, do we, can we say what it means to do the same theory in space-time in a different dimension? And that was slightly exotically how we began, and we realized that the reason we couldn't answer that question is that we didn't know what it meant to do the same physics in all space-times of the same dimension. So it was a quixotic uh, question that led to a useful, I hope, uh, discovery. Okay. I will speak again.